much for talking with me today. Oh my goodness, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we've been trying to set up this interview for a long time. <laughs> I've been following you for a while on Twitter, but finally Same. here we are. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you know, actually, it's interesting. I came across you not through like Iran Twitter, but through which you sometimes participate in, but through Med Twitter, because somehow mm -hmm. I, I like started becoming interested in uh, doctors on Twitter and specifically black doctors years ago when I started getting more into um, Twitter. And I found that it's a really interesting way to find to learn about like the the problems of society at large through black med Twitter. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a really good point. That's a, it's a really good point. It's a little microcosm of the, the problems in the country, in the greater country. Yeah. Completely. So I appreciate your podcast a lot and what you do. So, so yeah, your podcast house of pod, can you tell us a little bit about that? So it's a show that I co-host with my uh, friend, Lizzie, we're both doctors and we, talk about medical topics for the most part. Sometimes we don't, um, but we, we try to discuss medical topics in a way that we think is really relatable to people. I mean, we use our real voices. Like, you know, a lot of medical shows are out there and it's like the people sound super smart and professional, right? Um, but they don't quite sound like what I think doctors really sound like, you know, in mm -hmm. our closed door meetings when there's not patients around. So we thought it'd be good to have a show where people could hear, you know, what we really sound like and how we really talk. So, right. you know, it, it's half of our audience is people who are just interested, have no background in medicine, but are interested in the topics. And then the other half are like doctors or nurses who are like, I'm glad they said that, or I'm glad they put this person on that said that. Right. And I mean, it's become a lot more, uh, a lot more relatable now with COVID times. I mean, you guys have talked about that a lot, uh, issues yeah. that come with that. Um, like your co-host went to New York in the very beginning and was yeah. working there for a while. And you've been talking about vaccinations and just all the issues that come up with that. So as a person who's not in the medical field, I really appreciate everything that you do. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And I have to mention, so this is, uh, our podcast is Growing Up Iruni, and you throw in a lot of Iranian factoids in there as often <laughs> as you can. <laughs> I, I, I think it's important to do. Listen, there's not a lot of, I mean, it, it, there's not a lot of Iranian entertainers out there. Um, not that we're not trying, but you know, <laughs> they're not like letting us into places. So I think it's important for us to push wherever we can. And, you know, and <laughs> for example, um, there are things that I didn't know until we had a listener who is a beer brewer in Brooklyn, right. um, send us, uh, some beer that was, uh, that was Iranian style beer. And from that, you know, I started to, I was like, oh, we, we make beer in Iran. That's interesting. I wanted to look into that. And then I found, oh, the first beer ever made was in Iran, in the Zagros right. Mountains of Iran. So through that process, you know, the listeners have also educated me. And then I want to share that with, you know, everyone else on the show. So I think it's really important. I think it's super fun. I mean, come on, we've done a lot of cool <laughs> stuff. Neurosurgery, pajamas, high heels, all this, all this stuff, you know. That's surgery. Beer. I that's didn't us. even know yeah. that. No, no. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think it's quite the same neurosurgery we have today, but you know, the start, the beginning of it. You right. Know, I did. A lot I of these things started with the Persian Empire. I did listen to the episode where you brought up the beer, and uh, you told your co-host you were like, "Do you know where beer comes from?" And she's like, "Well, judging from all the conversations we have of all the things that come from <laughs> Iran, yeah. I'm guessing Iran." <laughs> that, that's right. That's yeah, right. which is very relatable. But let's go back. It tolerates to me well. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's go back to your childhood and uh, tell me about where were you born and uh, and where did you grow up? So I was born in Indiana, um, which is not what people are expecting when they see my name and they ask where I'm from. And I tell them Indiana. Um, yeah, but I grew up mostly in the Bay Area, in California, in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. So that's that's where I am still in San Francisco. Uh, okay. Haven't really left too far other than for some training purposes. So when did your parents leave Iran? Uh, they left before the revolution, mm. um, a little bit to before Indiana? the revolution. To Indiana? Actually, uh, <laughs> New York first, okay. uh, and then Indiana. And then they weren't in Indiana long before they realized that it wasn't for them, and then California eventually. Okay, so what was your relationship to uh, first the Persian language growing up and then the Persian culture in general? So my parents had two kids before me, and they were older, five and six years older. So they had kind of already been broken down by the time they got <laughs> to me. So I understood Farsi for the most part. I mean, I, I still to this day have maybe like a 
three or four year olds articulation of mm -hmm. the language. Um, but I was able to understand it for the most part, just because I heard it around the house. They had already sort of broken down though and, and started speaking English for the most part around me. So I, I could hear it and I could recognize it. And still to this day, I think I have a, a better comprehension than someone who had no background in it. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of that was, it wasn't heavy in my upbringing. Okay, so then you never learned to read and write or anything like that? Well, in college, oh. I went, uh, I took a, a class, I took a Farsi class at Berkeley. And, <laughs> uh, and I was there and uh, the teacher was like the first, I remember the first week, like three or four times she asked me, she was like, Nima ni, right? Which it means like half and half, right? Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm full. She's like, <laughs> And she just had this disapproving look. I was like, I'm so sorry. I know I'm a sellout. I'm so sorry. Well, what and about I, like three, four times? <laughs> what about your relationship with the culture? Like, were they, I mean, yeah, Th that, that was there. That was there. Um, not, I mean, so how familiar are you with the differences between Northern California and Southern California, Iranian? Texas, I'm all Texas. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. So I'm NorCal Iranian, which is a pretty big difference than South California Iranian. And so like, you know, when I would watch something like the Shah's of Sunset with like my friends up here, I would be as lost as anybody. I'd be like, what is Same. this? It's so, right. Because you know what I've learned about Iranians is that we will go to a place and we will adapt to that place. And then we'll take that to like the next level. <laughs> we will take it to an extreme. So if you put an Iranian in, in Ohio, oh, that dude is definitely on the football team. That's He's funny. got a pickup okay. truck. You know, <laughs> if you put an Iranian in Northern California, they're going to be crunchy granola. We're all very uh -huh. progressive for the most part, liberal, involved in politics, etc. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that's why I have the cowboy boots, the cowboy hat, and just <laughs> the truck. Oh, we just, we, we take shit. Huh, can, I, okay. can, I, can I cuss? I'm sorry. Sure, yeah. <laughs> we take shit to extreme sometimes. Okay. So it's like, that's how it is. And so like you go to Southern California, the Iranians are very different. They adapted to that Southern California ideal. They're like, they have the flashiest cars. They have like right. the flashiest homes. They dress with a lot of, they love panache, you know? Right. So um, Northern California is just a little bit less like that. It's a little bit like quieter. We celebrated New Year's. We did the holidays. We still okay. do all that stuff. But generally with, with a little bit less gusto than okay. say Southern California Iranians. So then when you grew up, were you resentful of the fact that you couldn't speak Farsi or is it something that you've like been trying to do or what, what's your relationship with it now? It, it was frustrating for a while because, you know, if we had family members come by, I couldn't communicate with them. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're young and you're trying to communicate with grandparents from a different culture, I think that's always going to be a bit of a challenge, even if right. the language isn't there. Um, I ended up marrying a, a woman who is much more Iranian than me and speaks fluently. And actually from that process, I, my Farsi has improved quite a bit because she speaks to our kids and, you know, I was tired of my kids correcting my Farsi. Right. So I started to learn a little bit more over time because of that. It's still not great, but my comprehension has definitely improved. Interesting. So yeah, let's talk about that. How did you meet your wife and what was your relationship with you know, Iranian culture with her. Did y'all have that in common or was it more like <laughs> something that was different with you two? I think she thought I was a white guy at first. <laughs> I don't think she thought there was, I don't think she she thought much of me at first at all. Um, you know, she worked at the hospital, she's a doctor and I was there in training capacity um, in, my, in my training to be a uh, gastrointestinal doctor. And she called with a consult, she called, um, the, the, the phone and I answered the phone. I said, hi, this is Kave. And she said, hey, it's me. Are you gonna come see this patient in blank, blank, blank? And I said, who, who's me? I mean, who are you? And she thought it was someone else. So there was this oh. bit of confusion. And so we got off to the wrong foot, like right away, uh -huh. like got into an argument on the phone, like uh -huh. right there. And then like, I ran into her like outside of the patient's room and I was like, oh, she's cute, damn it. And then <laughs> we started talking and then we started dating and one thing led to another. We ended up getting married. And now, um, you know, she's much more in tune with the culture. So because of that, I've learned a, a ton more, um, which is great. I mean, I've learned a lot Was more. she born there? She was. And she okay. came here like when she was like six. Wow. Okay. So does she have an accent speaking English? No, she doesn't. She doesn't have an accent, but her, her Farsi is, is pretty fluent, I think. Okay, I think seven years old is kind of the cutoff of when you can Seems like it, right? Yeah, completely yeah. adopt a cult. So then what about your children? Does she speak Farsi with them or is she? 
She does. And the oldest one understands it, um, but will not speak it back to her. Um, but he understands it. The youngest one, it's a similar sort of concept. He understands a little bit less, I think. Um, but I think he purposely goes out of his way to not understand it. Um, I, I think they're probably going to end up being a lot like me, which is they're not going to speak it, but okay. they'll probably be able to understand it better. Okay, so then here's my big question of what you think in general. Like, do you think it is important to learn the language and to speak it? I do. I do. I actually okay. really love learning languages. I mean, I think growing up with two languages, it helped me, uh, it predisposed me to learning other languages quicker. So as a doctor, for example, I know how to speak a little bit in a lot of different languages. So if I have a patient that comes in and they're okay. Mandarin speaking, I can speak enough to them just oh. to sort of let them know that I care enough to learn about their language. That goes a long way. It really helps connect the bond or Spanish, which in California is really useful. Uh, you know, even a little bit Tagalog, you know, to work with like uh, patients or other doctors or nurses okay. uh, from the Philippines. So it really, uh, it really, I think language is super important in terms of creating bonds, not just between family, but also because like, when you go to a restaurant, when you go to a place that that's their primary language, if you're able to speak even a little bit to them, it really shows people that you respect their culture and respect them. It goes a long way. Interesting. Right. Okay. That's really interesting. But it's not something you're like actively seeking out right now to. No, my brain is full already. <laughs> right. like yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not like taking <laughs> lessons or anything at this point. Okay. Got it. Got it. Well, so let's go back to your being a doctor. So <laughs> this was a big question that I have. So there's always the stereotype of like Iranian parents wanting their kids to grow up to be a doctor or a lawyer. So what advice do you have? Like your parents were very successful in this, obviously. What advice do you have for Iranian parents to get their children to move into this field? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. Well, first <laughs> of all, I, I, I would say, uh, I think there's always I mean, if nothing else, this pandemic has shown us that you, you, there are certain jobs that are indispensable. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when the pandemic started and my wife and I were going into the hospital to deal with COVID, it was pretty scary. But uh, on the other hand, we were also lucky because we knew that, like, unlike a lot of our friends and a lot of our neighbors, we had job security, you know, mm -hmm. because of this. It was it was not fun going into the hospital, particularly in those early days, not knowing what could happen. And, you know, we were both terrified on some, I was, she was really brave, but you know, me, I was always a little scared. Right. And like, there's, we're both doctors, we're both gonna be exposed. What could right. potentially happen to our kids if we both get sick? You know, those are thoughts that would, would keep me up at night, literally keep me up at night. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a job that I've never been without work. I mean, mm -hmm. I've always, it's always been there. And I think it always will. Um, and I think there's a security there that's really nice. Mm -hmm. and on top of that, I, for me, I think education still is important. I mean, you hear these people like, what's his name? Elon Musk talk about right. how education isn't that important. Like, look, I didn't go to Harvard, but the guys who work for me did. I'm like, yeah, it's because you inherited money from your parents' emerald mine. Right. You know, like right. it's not everyone's that lucky. And education still is the way to go. I, I think I'd stress that, but I don't think you can force the doctor route. And I'll, and I'll say, I, I know a lot of people who I feel probably were forced and they're not happy now. Mm -hmm. I, you know, in the, the process of going through medical school, actually even before that, doing pre-med, there's so many hoops and there's so many hurdles you have to go through that to some degree, you just have to do them. You can't mm -hmm. think about it. You have to put your head down and just get through each barrier and never stop to think about, is this really what I want to do? Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people who did that. They went through that. They did, they did all that stuff. Because if you stop to think about it, if you start to flounder, then you lose your momentum. It becomes really challenging. Right. But on the flip side, if you go through the whole time, you're never thinking about, is this something I really want to do? You end up being in a really tough job and it, you work hard and it's a stressful gig mm -hmm. and it pays well for sure. But there are a lot of other jobs that pay well. And some of these people are miserable doing it. Like I know unhappy doctors. So it's something I would, I would hesitate to encourage people to blindly push their children into. I do think right. pushing ed education is still very important. Mm -hmm. Pushing a job that has some professional stability, really important. But at the same time, um, if they don't seem to have an interest in the medicine, if you've exposed them to it and they don't seem to care I would be reluctant to advise people to push that any further. Right. So what, what was it for you? Were you called to it? 
for me, it was, I, I was a little bit, but it was a bit of a family career. My dad's a doctor. Mm, okay. Um, now my older, my older siblings are not doctors. Um, for me though, it seemed like a really important job. I right. always wanted to do something important. I felt I, I wanted to do something important and it, and it really fit that role. There was a moment though, where I almost didn't, I, uh, or at least not right away. It was towards the end of college. At that time I was uh, playing music in a band. Um, right. The, and I still play with them. Um, all the music from the show comes from this band. And we were playing quite a bit at that time. And we were just starting to pick up a little bit, getting a little bit of local radio airtime. And we had to make this decision. We had to make this decision and say, okay, are we going to do this or not? Yeah. Are we going to fully dedicate ourselves to this or not? And it came down to one night where I decided for sure that I had to apply to medicine. We were at a small little club. And there was a, a band there that was playing. They're from the early 70s, late 60s. I won't say their name because they were mm -hmm. super nice to us. They were very cool. But they were a band that was at one point huge. You've heard their songs. It's been in movies. And they were there playing this tiny little club, uh -huh. the kind of club that we, a no-name band, would be playing. And we were hanging out with them afterwards. And I just remember feeling kind of sad about it. The mm -hmm. lead singer, who was this really smooth English guy, who I'm sure back in the day was just incredibly successful at picking mm -hmm. up women. He like, I remember some college girl walked by him and he tapped her on the shoulder and he said, where are you sleeping tonight, love? Oh, and no. she, just, she just gave him this look like, ugh, and she walked off. And I remember seeing that and being like, oh, this is depressing. This oh, is so man. sad. This is what happens if a band makes it. If you're one of the 0.001% of bands that actually makes it and has success, this is what happens to you eventually. Oh, Not yeah. everyone is the Rolling Stones. Not everyone is the Beatles forever and ever, right. you know, being making money off their, their music. At some point you have to transition. And at that point I was like, yeah, that's not, that's not how I want to live my older years. That's not how I want so to be. So interesting. I decided that's the point where I decided I applied to medical school, like pretty much the next week. Wow. That's really interesting. Yeah. That was, that was it for me. Well, so I've actually had this podcast for 10 years now, which is unbelievable, but uh, the the beginning in the beginning I was teaching a friend Matt how to speak the Persian language that's how it started and mm -hmm. Matt actually left after maybe three years into the podcast to go to med school and he's actually finishing up now and he's going to come back and we're going to do some more episodes together oh, but for him, yeah but for him it was always really nice I mean he he was choosing between that and like becoming a theater actor so he was a perfect like you know very dedicated person very reliable very fun to listen to um, cause he has that like the theatrical thing. So it reminded me of you and your podcast, uh, that there's this whole stereotype with Iranian parents who, um, who say like, okay, yeah, sure. Go do your fun thing. Like be in a band or whatever, but also be a right. doctor. <laughs> right. So you, you, you somehow successfully managed to do that. You have your podcast and, uh, and you're also a medical doctor. So is that your creative outlet? Like, is that how that came about? Yeah, yeah, totally. You're right. Um, let me <laughs> let me first let me first start by also clarifying that a, a one limiting factor was also that we weren't very good. <laughs> I want to make that really clear. So, like, you know, if your kid is really good at music, then yeah. you know, you maybe give them a shot at it. Right. But you know, I knew that we also weren't very good, so right. that that helps a lot. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, you know, there are certain things you can do as a hobby, you know. And there's certain things you can't. I can do music as a hobby. I can't do medicine as a hobby. Mm -hmm. um, and the we were playing music quite a bit, but as I was getting older and I, you know, wasn't really interested in doing long traveling gigs or anything like that, um, I decided to sort of uh, pivot a little bit, for lack of a better word. And that's the show was was a really good opportunity for me to do that. You know, and, and I, it, it's an entertainment thing. I do really enjoy doing the entertainment thing, yeah. but at the same time, I don't know if I would be any use to the world doing entertainment outside of medical entertainment. You know what I mean? Right. So if right. I didn't have this medical thing, I don't think I would be very entertaining. Got it. So if the podcast like blew up to the point where, you know, that could become your full-time thing, do you think you would transition to that or you'd still want to have both? Oh my God. I would sell out in a minute. It, no. <laughs> Um, I don't actually, it's a good question. Probably not. I think I still would need to do some work. I mean, I, I think I still feel the, the job we have now is tough and the job we have has a lot of drawbacks. Um, but it's still, like I said, I feel like it's an important job. I feel like I'm doing something important and, uh, I, I don't think I'm ready to give that up.
Cool. Well, to transition a little bit back to Iranian stuff, what are your plans for Nowruz? It's coming up next week as we record this. Yes, I have plans Yes. <laughs> that my wife has made and whatever those are, I will do. I don't entirely know. I go where I'm told well, uh, pretty much. Yeah. I, I operate one week at a time. Well, a lot of the Iranian people that I've uh, interviewed say that, you know, they feel like the wife in the relationship is the one who kind of drives the whole cultural stuff. And I've noticed there's a lot of like American wives now that are creating products for like Nowruz and things like that because oh, wow. their husbands don't, like they're still the driver of Iranian right. culture and the family, even if their husband is the one who's. Well, that's the thing about like, you know, remember when I was young and still to this day, people who don't know about Iranians have this weird perception that women are subjugated, which in some ways they are over there, you know, for sure. Right. But like the truth of it is women run the culture in the household and Iranian Definitely. women are in charge. And if you're an Iranian guy, whether or not you marry an Iranian woman or not, you're looking for that in a woman. Right. You're looking for a, <laughs> a take charge kind of woman. I mean, uh -huh. my wife was basically the one was like, uh, decided at one point we we're going to get married. And that's how, <laughs> you know, that's how it happened for me. That's, that's what, that's what Iranian men do. So, you know, um, I, I, it makes total sense. We are going to do family stuff for sure. Um, and, uh, I am looking forward to that. I, I do enjoy the whole, I, I enjoy the, the kids enjoyment of it at this point. Right. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for talking with me and thank you for your awesome podcast. It's so much fun to listen to and people can find you. Oh, tell us uh, where people can find the podcast, iTunes, so, Spotify, so all that. You can find us pretty much anywhere you get your pods casted, um, <laughs> iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, et cetera. Um, you can follow us at Twitter at the House of Pod. We also highly have recommended. Facebook. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I think if you enjoy hearing educated people talk about stuff in a relatable way, um, we try to teach and we try to entertain. And uh, I think you'll, if you're interested to hear how doctors actually speak, um, I think you might enjoy the show. So check it out, The House Wonderful. of Pod. And thanks for all the work that you've been doing. Hopefully we're seeing the end, light at the end of the tunnel with this uh, pandemic. And hopefully see you on the other side and all of you all. <laughs> I know. I know. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing your show. I love the show. So um, I'm really excited to be on it. And uh, maybe one day we'll we'll do a, another show in person when, when I visit Austin. With a back home beer. We'll do that. That's right. That back home <laughs> beer. Or back home that, brewery. Dang it. That's I forget right. the That's right. The that's title. right. <laughs> we'll, we'll include a shout out to her. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you.